These are three real-life survival stories of horrifying encounters with the most evil serial killers the world has ever seen. These scary stories show even a fleeting glimpse into their subconscious minds of a place of true horror. In Australia's Tenterfield, Catherine Mary Knight was born in the year 1955. She was a byproduct of her mother and father, Ken Knight, having a scandalous affair. Knight herself alleges that she was repeatedly sexually attacked by many family members until the age of 11. Her father was a violent drinker who raped her mother several times each day. She was a notorious bully who left her job at the age of 15 to work in an arbiter and a clothes factory. She met David Kellett, a violent drinker similar to her father, who was prone to fights while working in the butcher shop. Knight startled him by joining one of the inebriated fights. He immediately understood that Knight could inflict more than minor harm with her fists. Knight and Kellett had three legal marital consumptions on their wedding night. Knight was upset over her new husband's tiredness and wanted a fourth round when he fell asleep. So she began to strangle him. When Kellett awoke, he was able to defeat Knight. Catherine Knight, despite her best efforts, was frequently unfaithful and once abandoned her husband and their two daughters in the middle of the night. Knight threatened many people with a stolen axe after learning about one of Kellett's affairs and abandoned their two-month-old infant on the neighborhood train lines. She was also given a postpartum depression diagnosis and spent a few months in a mental health facility. David Saunders, a local miner, and Knight entered a frenzied romance in 1986, but their union swiftly turned toxic and violent. She later met John Chillingworth, and the two were together for three years before having Eric, Knight's first son. Knight and Price's relationship had no issues at first, but it came to an end when Chillingworth discovered that Knight was having an affair with John Charles Thomas Price. In 1995, when they moved in together, everything was going well. Catherine Knight and John Charles Thomas Price were in a relationship, but when she proposed marriage and he declined, she became aggressive. Price was dismissed after she fatally accused him of stealing from his employer. They rekindled their relationship a few months later, but he wouldn't allow her to move back in. Price and Knight got into a fight in February 2000 that ended with her trying to stab Knight in the chest. He filed for a restraining order against her in an effort to protect his kids. Price informed his co-workers that Knight would kill him if he ever went missing toward the end of the month. Knight stabbed Price 37 times on February 29, 2000, using a butcher knife that was lying next to her bed. Knight carried his lifeless body downstairs, skinned him, and hanged it from a meat hook in the living room after he succumbed to his injuries. After that, she severed his head from his body and chopped off chunks of it to cook with potatoes, pumpkin, beets, zucchini, cabbage, squash, and gravy. In 2001, authorities detained Catherine Knight and accused her of killing John Charles Thomas Price. Despite Knight's denials that she remembered the previous night, she was soon accused of killing him. Her trial started in October 2001, although it didn't get very far. Knight altered her plea to guilty for unspecified reasons, and the judge closed the case without hearing any testimony. The judge mandated that her papers be marked never to be released when she was led into prison that day. Australia's first woman received a life sentence without the possibility of release. Knight continued to claim innocence and declines to take any responsibility for her deeds. Knight appealed her sentence, but it was quickly dismissed. She is still at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, carrying out her life sentence. Less than a year into their marriage, Matthew Phelps and Lauren Hugelmeyer Phelps were still on their honeymoon. They were enthusiastic about starting a family, devoted Christians, and fans of Star Wars. When Matthew woke up covered in blood on September 1, 2017, and discovered his wife lying seriously hurt on the floor with many stab wounds, he immediately dialed 911. He had taken a cough suppressant meant for those with high blood pressure the night before, since he felt like he was the murderer and was attempting to justify his actions. Matthew tried to justify his actions by claiming he had taken more medicine than he should have, as emergency services were called. According to him, he took Corsin cough and cold since he knew it would help him feel better. And sometimes I have trouble falling asleep at night. Could Matthew have accidentally attacked his wife while using cough medicine? 
a devoted husband named Matthew Phelps was detained after fatally stabbing his wife, Lauren, 123 times in the head, neck, and arms. Although Bayer, the drug's manufacturer, expressed condolences in a statement, it stressed that there is no proof linking coricidin to violent behavior. Matthew had a murdering compulsion, which became evident as investigators dug deeper into his life. Under the alias Marty Radical, he maintained a covert Instagram account where he posted about his obsession with the 2000 movie American Psycho, which stars Patrick Bateman as a wealthy New York banker. Friends claimed that the pair had been fighting frequently, particularly over Matthew's excessive spending. When Matthew fatally killed his wife, the police found that he was acting with complete knowledge of what he was doing. He had attempted to exploit his history of recreational cough medicine abuse to justify his actions, but even he must have understood it was a long shot. Indicated for murder, Matthew James Phelps was turned down for bail. In exchange for a plea agreement that spared him the death penalty, he admitted his guilt. Lauren's family, friends, and churchgoers attended the sentencing wearing blue t-shirts with the hashtag, hashtag Lauren's Light on the front and purple ribbons to raise awareness for domestic abuse. In a brief statement, Matthew expressed regret for his behavior. His defense team claimed that he had battled depression for many years and had grown up in a household where he had watched slasher films since he was four years old. Beth, Lauren's older sister, claimed that although they had let Matthew stay with them because they believed he made her happy, he was merely playing a joke. They never once believed Lauren was in danger, according to her. Dale, Lauren's father, claimed that they had treated Matthew like a son. He questioned, how could he do this to us? Dale had pledged to defend his daughter when Matthew sought his approval to marry Lauren. Matthew was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. It's difficult to believe how it all turned out when looking back at Lauren and Matthew's old social media pictures. Matthew was concealing a gloomy, ominous side behind his dazzling face. We'll never know if Lauren was aware of the extent of her husband's power, but it's more likely that she just became aware of it as she was dying. When his wife, Lori Hacking, didn't come home from jogging on July 19, 2004, Mark Hacking called the Salt Lake City Police to report it. At 10.46 a.m., he called them once more to let them know he had located her car parked close to the canyon where she had gone for a run. A search was launched and many people offered their assistance. The couple's apartment also included a hunting knife with blood on it, as well as Lori's pocketbook, wallet, and car keys. On July 20th, authorities were notified of a disturbance because Mark was allegedly running around outside a hotel in only his sandals. After that, he was checked into a mental facility. By July 21st, Mark and Lori's families were aware that Mark had falsified his University of Utah graduation date and had been turned down for administration in medical school. He had crisscrossed the country holding phony interviews at several medical schools, all the while feigning to be in class, reading textbooks, and writing term papers. Mark Hacking, a pediatrician and nurse, was well known for lying about his educational history. However, a few days before Lori Hacking went missing, his fabrication began to fall apart. When Lori called Mark's medical school on Friday, July 16, to inquire about financial aid, she was informed that he wasn't enrolled. After that, she left a message for the principal, claiming that her husband had straightened everything out. Mark may have killed Lori as a result of her outreach to the school, according to prosecution and others, as that is when his lying first became clear. On August 9th, Mark was accused of first-degree murder after being detained on August 2nd. The remains of Lori were never found after two months of police searching at local landfills. However, a few days before Lori Hacking went missing, his fabrication began to fall apart. In 2004, the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah created the Lori brother. Lori would have loved him as he was giving it his all. A typewritten letter from Lori to Mark was discovered in the couple's extra bedroom during the investigation into Lori's disappearance. She may have called the medical school she believed Mark was enrolled in on July 16th in relation to it. Her family created the Lori K. Soares Hacking Memorial Scholarship at the University of Utah's David Eccles School of Business, which helps girls and women who are underprivileged and going through difficult times. Deadly Deception, the Mark Hacking Story 
a documentary about the case, was broadcast on a and &E in 2004. Thelma Soares, the mother of Lori, has written letters to Mark while he's incarcerated. She claims that she has pardoned him in order to feel better. She still laments the loss of her daughter, though. She added, You never get over it, in a 2014 Deseret News interview. I'm still not over it. I will never get over it. You get past the suddenness of it. However, you never recover from the loss. Stay safe and always keep an eye out for these unexpected things. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Keep watching.